Welcome. My name is Michael O'Connor. I'm artistic director of Rhizome, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to World on Wire Dialogues 2 with Mikhail Maximov and Tabor Roback. Um, this event is the second in a series of three online conversations that will be followed by um, an event in Moscow later this fall that are being organized uh, by Rhizome of the New Museum, a digital art organization that was founded in 1996 by artist Mark Tribe and has been an affiliate and residence at the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York City since 2003, and Garage Digital, the platform of Garage Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, I'm joined today by uh, the artists, uh, Mikhail Maximov and Tebo Robak, and also um, my collaborator, Nikita Nechayev of Garage Digital, um, who you'll hear from in, uh, in just a moment. Um, today's program or this series is structured so that it brings together artists from Rhizome's program and artists from the Garage Digital program, in particular with a focus on, um, on the Rhizome side, World on a Wire, which is the exhibition that Rhizome of the New Museum organized this year in partnership with Hyundai Motor. Um, it premiered in Beijing uh, at Hyundai Motor Studio Beijing and is currently on view at Hyundai Motor Studio Seoul and online at worldonawire.net. This fall, it will go to Hyundai Motor Studio Moscow. So this event is being held partly as a preview of that uh, and also as a kind of uh, parallel to some garage programs that Nikita will tell you about in just a moment. Um, World on a Wire draws its name from the film by Reiner Werner Fassbinder. It explores um, the possibilities and problems of artistic simulation from a range of different perspectives. And um, today's event will explore those themes in relation to um, two artists that draw both on kind of video game culture and art historical reference and work that um, often models and depicts nature and movement in different kinds of ways and systems. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Nikita to say a few words about, uh, about the Garage Digital program and about today's event. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm also happy to welcome everybody. I'm really happy that we have our participants joining us today. It's so great to continue this small series of events that we're doing together with uh, Rhizome. Let me present myself as well. My name is Nikita Nichayev. I'm a research curator of the Garage Digital Program. It's a program organized by the Garage Museum of Contemporary Arts. Uh, that supports uh, artistic and research projects uh, that interact with innovation technologies in different ways. So today, we will continue to talk about uh, practices of various artists, discuss it with the artists themselves. Uh, these are all artists uh, that interact uh, with simulations uh, in different ways. Um, we have Robak, we have Mikhail Maximov, um, with us tonight uh, and i'm going to start by passing the floor to mikhail before i do that i'll say that uh, his works are currently on display at the exhibition uh, choosing distance uh, at the garage museum uh, it's going to run till the weekend if you haven't had a chance to check it out please do so not much time left uh, and his uh, the tool uh, is also available on the Garage Digital platform. It's always available there. And uh, to start off, we'll ask the artists to showcase some of their works uh, from the projects that they're going to be talking about uh, with a small commentary. And I'm going to pass the floor to Mikhail. Mikhail, hi. I'm incredibly happy to see and hear everyone, uh, Tabor, Michael, Nikita. And uh, as Nikita said in his intro, right, um, uh, he mentioned flatality. My work that's currently on display at Garage. Um, I would like to start uh, by telling you about uh, the way I came about producing this work uh, because uh, it contains the prerequisites uh, that uh, got me to doing what I'm doing today. I edited a small video 
for you today of this work, uh, about five minutes in total, to showcase the installation that you can check out at the Garage uh, Museum. Uh, this is an excerpt. Uh, this is not the final work, uh, but uh, this is something that's indicative. You'll understand a bit more about its visuality. Maybe we can start with that and then we'll continue with that work. Uh, The world doesn't seem real. It feels so weird. It's not like you're dreaming, but it is at the same time. It's like you're not getting this feeling of reality. Everything seems unreal, plastic, uh, weird both inside and outside and i just want to stand to one point it's all so strange i have no idea what it is i have no idea who i am what's happening with me this is a very strange feeling it's really frightening I've gotten so used to rituals uh, recently at 4 a.m. Uh, I start to feel ecstatic, uh, feeling both human and like an animal, like creatures that do everything the other way around. Uh, beyond my consciousness, uh, they live in the air around me. Beyond my consciousness, I cannot control them. All of my psyche is controlled by them. I'm no longer myself. I don't belong to myself anymore. I was born in the gastronomy shop, uh, a well-known economist, but I always wanted to be a librarian. I was a shop assistant, something that's necessary for the economy. It's a system of 120 units. Uh, a good manual is much more important than the gastronomy shop on the Harrison Street. Uh, and in the Harrison Street, uh, you will find uh, a discrete manual as it goes through gastronomy number 22 and be replaced in line with the formula of economic unity. It's Friday. Everything is changing every month. Uh, we're writing a new price. I was feeling okay, but feeling a bit stormy at the same time as usual. Uh, well, I paid up, and then this man and woman, they enter by the front door. They open it themselves. So two walk into the house. They start a discussion. That's good. That's wonderful. That's not going to work. Thoughts are piercing me, thoughts dispersed, my psyche is ecstatic, one song replaced by another, different men and women made of fire are captivating all of my thoughts, uh, dictating me to poison myself, uh, food is smelling like dead people, they're taking my thoughts, they're placing the thoughts into my head. They told me that I'm a doll, that I need to drink some water. They poison the air around me, so it doesn't smell. Hey, 
пространство предстает пред мной как какое-то расплывчатое, какое-то stops being transparent it leads to everything seeming flat everything visible becomes photographic everything visible is like in the dark like i exist in the dark the reality irritates me it is present presented to me like from distance i the specific i do not enter my historical existence what emerges is diving deeper into my own being and existence. There are two eyes being present in me. One eye is white, the other is black. While the black one is winning over the white, I'm going to bed. My whole body is itching. The Russian sadness is being present to me. All of these pieces of coal all around my body suggest to me that I'm irritated, I'm sad, and I don't know why. Now, I guess I should make a couple of comments. I would like to explain the origins of this work. So first of all, I would like to talk about how this work appeared. Here I could, I think, lay bare at least three layers. The title of the piece is Flagtality, as you have read. And I borrow it from Mortal Kombat where it means uh, the option of murdering your enemy. Here I use paraphrasing. I turn to one of the most difficult clinical psychotic condition of a human being when the space around a human being is dissected in 2D. Um, flat spaces and it is very often diagnosed as a symptom of an upcoming psychosis all the texts you heard were voiced by machines but um, the texts are monologues of uh, people who find themselves in an acute stage of psychosis they are people with different back backgrounds really different people uh, from very different eras, starting with 1960s and finishing with today. So the text are documentary pieces. I was trying to combine these texts, these monologues, these autobiographic pieces with the current technology of photogrammetry. Nowadays, it is used quite widely uh, to provide for 3D structures. And in this case, I work with landscapes specifically. When I connect monologues of different individuals uh, with long shots of landscapes, I uh, took the original material, the raw material, uh, from the train window while going by train in Russia. So initially, these were the Russian landscapes. And I translate the specific landscapes into the universal. I go beyond a specific landscape or a specific individual and his or her experience to something more universal. And one more thing to say, in Russia, and I think not only in Russia, but in other countries, too, there, there used to be a cult of fools. Fools are people that uh, can afford um, to say things that other people can't dare to say, 
and um, they are taken. They used to be taken by the medieval society as prophets. Normally, their speech is broken. Their speech is not logically constructed. I think that not Nostradamus is one of such cases too. In our today's world, neural networks are trying to generate some meaningful texts, and we can see that this idea of prediction is being projected on machines. And I was wondering about this quality of trust. I think trust is an important component of this piece of this work. And it also seemed to me that when I combine all of these elements and when I increase the scale, I can also afford to take a stance um, in the relationship with the current political situation in our country. One more important thing to say, which I think has to be highlighted, I wanted to create a new dramaturgical possibility, which I didn't fu uh, fully succeed in. So, um, like uh, the axis, the horizontal axis is stretched over thousands of kilometers. It's a kind of a theatrical stage, which is on the move all the time. And the timeline is much more stretched than all the other axes we are working with. And I thought it could lead to a new narrative, which is not only tied to time. So I think this is it. This is it. Yeah, and maybe just to sum it up, to sum up my words, I think that this work Here, technically, I work with over, with projectors and all of the components are technically synchronized with each other. And I think that technically these works are similar to Tibo's works, but I was trying to dismantle the overall scheme going from something regular to something more psychotic. And this is a very important link for me, a very important connection for me. This is it, I think. Thank you. I'm also very curious about um, uh, the research of, for new narrative, a kind of a new narrative that can be built with new technologies, which are available to us now. And what I also find interesting is the hardware facilities that enable us to do so. This is kind of new materiality, which is embodied in metal, which is calculating for us. And I think it's a huge topic for Tabor too, and also one of his points of interest. So Tabor, if that's okay with you, I would like to pass the mic over to you. And uh, maybe you would like to share a couple of works of yours and to say a couple of words about them. Hi, yes, thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name's Tabor Roback. I'm an American artist living in New York City. Um, I specialize in digital tools and I've been working on the computer since I was very young. I grew up with you know early versions of Photoshop and over the years I you know taught myself the new tools. And uh, in the past, you know, for the past stretch of my artistic career, I've been really interested in programming and digital simulations. Um, one particular thread in my work that I'm gonna focus on today is simulations that are inspired by nature. Um, and it's not so much that I am inspired to recreate nature uh, precisely, but I look to, uh, you know, make an impression of nature in a way. So the first work I'd like to show you um, was prepared for a collaboration between uh, Rhizome and Hyundai, which Michael mentioned earlier. I'm gonna share my screen and show you. Let's see, here we go. 
So uh, this is the, the work butterfly room special edition um, installed on the outside of uh, Hyundai Motor Studio uh, Seoul. Um, here it is inside in Beijing and again in Beijing. And this piece uh, takes inspiration by some of the smallest life forms in nature, like amoebas and cells. And I kind of reproduce them on a massive scale. This piece once uh, took a different type of form where they were actually reproduced on a very small scale. And you can see them all at once. Um, here you can see that each one is running on a small Raspberry Pi based computer uh, with 100 tiny screens and all the wires. Um, and Alex, you can go ahead and play the first video. Let me uh, stop my screen sharing here. There we go. Пока что, пока что, кажется, видим а, а, какой-то... Sorry, all we see now is a frozen screen. So all we can see now is the kind of interface of a player. Okay, so now you can see it um, a little bit better. Um, so you can see here that, as I said, I've taken inspiration by the sort of smallest building blocks of life and nature. And I've re reproduced this here in 3D by working with the smallest building blocks of 3D modeling. So there's a real focus here on primitive geometry and simple shapes and the simplest types of movement. And I found that by combining these and you know, just the uh, most direct method you know, it very naturally ended up kind of uh, mimicking the nature of, you know, the tiny life forms you might see under a microscope. Um, would you like me to try sharing my screen? Uh, I guess you could share your screen as far as I understand. Yeah. Let's see here. So um, here, here we'll be able to see the uh, 100 little creatures in simpler or a more direct way. Um, you know, with these few here, you know, you can see that I'm playing with the simplest 3D element, which is a path, basically a line and I've cloned spheres along this line and applied a simple algorithm to modulate the size of the sphere over, uh, over time. Um, again, very simple creations with uh, meta balls and random movement, skip forward a little bit. Um, you know, this type of creation right here is uh, one that I'm really fond of where I've, you know, located all the axes on the geometry, which I'll show you over here. You can see here, each one of these little uh, spots on the cube is a vertex. And, you know, it doesn't get any simpler, you know, in 3D modeling than this. Um, and then I've, you know, used this little cloner module to attach uh, cylinders to each vertex. And then I've used this little formula module to modulate the geometry of the cube. And, you know, it's just with these few, few simple, you know, pieces that we've already kind of um, created something that looks like a sea urchin. 
Um, and I just find it's really pleasing how simple and direct and natural that is. And so for the special edition, which we, we've shown in uh, Beijing and, uh, and Seoul, um, these creatures have become life-size. This is an 8K video rendering. Um, so, you know, it's a huge file. This is a 45 minute video. And each one of these uh, little creatures kind of floats in and out of the screen um, in a very, you know, soft and methodical way. And I've taken a lot of inspiration by, you know, the look of the aesthetic of an image uh, taken from a microscope. So the next work that I'll show you really quick is called North Star. She has audio, but I'm gonna mute it really quick. Um, so North Star is another nature inspired piece. And this piece was inspired by uh, a horseback ride that I, you know, I rode a horse and I was inspired by it. And so I've, here I've tried to model in, in uh, the game engine Unity, the sort of natural motion of the rocking back and forward of, you know, walking through the forest or riding a horse. I'm gonna switch over to a slightly larger version of this video. So when the software launches, you're able to enter the location, the latitude and the longitude of where the video is being played. So that once the video starts, the, uh, well, not, it's not a video, it's a simulation. Once the simulation starts, the sunlight and the time of day are matched to the specific, specific spot on Earth where it's being shown. Um, this piece goes on infinitely and all the trees and grass and the different dirt texture and the flowers, they all kind of appear right before your eyes. If you look really closely, you can see them growing. Um, in order to create the, you know, this infinite space and not have the computer crash, uh, you know, because in a video game, you can't have infinite geometry, it just won't run. I create a little program that sort of plants seeds along the horizon. Um, I made a little drawing here. You can see this is a top-down view of the camera that's moving through the forest. Here's the big trees. And at the very end of the horizon line, tiny little seeds of trees are being planted. And then as the camera moves closer towards them, the trees grow bigger. Let's see if we can see it in the video. If you look way out here on the horizon line, you'll see that the plants that end up being large in the foreground start out really small and they grow before uh, you can see them growing. See like this tree right here. And so it's kind of a little illusion, a little, you know, um, just a little magic trick in a way to make it look infinite. Um, but again, I think it's really cool, you know, just the nature of like, I'm using the idea of planting a seed and growing it to inform my programming decisions. Uh, the final piece I wanted to show you is called Tide Pool. And it's very different aesthetically. Uh, tide Pool is inspired by the way the sand moves when the water rushes over it at the beach. Um, what you see in this simulation are these sort of large painterly streaks with this distortion pulling on them, uh, you know, to the left and to the right. Uh, these painterly streaks are actually 3D models of seagulls that fly across the canvas and use a simple bird flocking uh, algorithm. Uh, to explain this better, I'll go back to my drawing here. You can see here that this is like one of the seagulls. Here's three seagulls. As they fly across the screen, they leave trails of color behind them. Um, but these trails of color remain on the screen. So you can see the bird right here, kind of. And then the distortion uh, shader that I've written kind of tears at the screen, pulls it this way and that way. Um, and it's just something I developed through experimentation. Um, and again, this is another time where I found that, you know, just through experimenting and using sort of the most basic elements of uh, the game development software and programming, I'm able to kind of achieve effects that mimic, you know, very simple phenomena of nature. Um, this is, since this is a simulation, this is another piece that goes on forever. 
And I find that that gives things a really nice quality, you know, because there's no beginning and there's no end. You just kind of watch it for however you want. It's, you know, it's almost like um, I feel like something that's infinitely long might as well just be, uh, you know, it's very similar to a painting in that way. So like a painting is infinitely still and this goes on forever and you can enter and leave it at any point. So those were the uh, three pieces I uh, wanted to share with you today. Um, you know, I've also taken a lot of inspiration from the video games I've played. And, um, you know, I, I think this is probably something we'll discuss further along in the conversation. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that, Tabor. It's so interesting to hear a little bit about the process behind these works. I think when we encountered them in the gallery, they come to us as these kind of almost hermetically sealed uh, things where it becomes, you know, I think a big part of the pleasure of artwork is understanding the agency of the people and tools that kind of shape the work itself. But what was interesting in both of your discussions was I think and this interest in, um, you know, in manipulating parameters of space and time um, as part of making, um, you know, works that revolve around simulation as a practice. Um, in our previous conversation on Monday with Sarah Kuhlman um, and Theo Triantaphilitis, we had a really interesting discussion about simulation and its relationship with representation. Um, because, you know, if you consider representation to be more like a form of mimesis of trying to make an image of the world, um, simulation as, you know, when it's used as a term, is more about building a model that can kind of produce an outcome. It might produce an unpredictable outcome in a computer simulation where parameters can change and different random variables can be introduced and so forth. So there's this element of, um, of liveness that I think is something that we associate with simulation or of uncertainty or generative outcomes. Um, I was curious, um, something that I'd like to hear a bit more about, especially from you, Michal, is um, when you use generative aspects of the work, and also this is also true of you, Tabor, um, because I think coming into this conversation, I had maybe had a distinction in my mind between works that are, you know, kind of developed in a 3D modeling program and then rendered as a flat video versus works that are generative, that have variables that can change in a live system that is executed maybe in a gallery space or on a user's computer. I think after seeing your discussions, I kind of want to modify that binary opposition that I, um, that I had set up in my own mind, because, you know, thinking about your work, Tabor, there's this interesting way in which there is a, an aspect of computation already in the modeling process. So even when the outcome is um, a rendering, you know, that particular rendering, you know, is just sort of offering like a kind of a kind of print of one of the examples of the way in which the system could have could have kind of evolved. Um, so I think my question is really when you work as an artist with these systems. Do you feel there's a really big shift between working on a live generative system versus developing um, a kind of rendered work that, um, that runs in a more linear way? Or are the two kind of actually quite continuous? Um, what new possibilities does it introduce when you work with live simulation as opposed to rendered simulation? Uh, to me, the biggest difference is a trade-off between visual fidelity and um, you know, random possibility. Um, you know, those are the two big strengths. For example, in the uh, Butterfly Room Special Edition, the, the, the scale at which it's displayed, the level of detail and the sort of the blurry depth of field effects, um, you know, all that was gained by making it a baked video, a rendered video. Um, whereas in the uh, procedurally generated works, the simulations, you can't necessarily render something at 8K in real time, and you can't necessarily have that same level of, um, you know, that kind of sm smooth, foggy effect uh, because it has to run in real time. Um, but what you gain in, a, in, in the trade-off is the fact that you open up the work to random possibilities. And I've always found that, uh, you know, with random possibilities, you can sometimes achieve better compositions or, you know, really special moments 
that you may not be able to achieve if you had sought out to, you know, to do it intentionally? Yeah, I think um, when there's a live element in a computational system, it does introduce that element of the system performing in a sense. And I was really struck by your use of, um, of that concept um, in thinking about your work, Michal. Um, because I think all of the, I, all of the video that we saw, that was all um, video recording of uh, work that would be normally encountered in more of a live system. Is that correct? And when you, when you use that kind of live simulation in the work, do you feel that there's something in that performance that gets you closer to that sense of, of trying to model, in a sense, a psychological state of psychosis? Or to evoke that state, let's say. Michael, I agree with you absolutely that with each level of introducing new elements to the system, we get results that are more and more unpredictable. And you can add the render, the non-real-time one. You can add that to the system, to the render system, you, you, and then you have the simulation in real life. Uh, and then you can add the multiplayer simulation, uh, integrating several actors, uh, including people. And these three elements, um, each of them add more and more complexity to the system. And I guess it takes it to a new level of complexity every time. And every time going from render to the multiplayer and in between you could have the real-time simulation. Well, out, choosing out of these three, we should always uh, keep in mind, uh, like to what extent do we need this unexpected element uh, or do we want it to be predictable? This is the artistic uh, guidelines for choice for me. The work that I showed you, these were renders. That's what I was trying to address. I was looking for a new narrative, uh, looking at the poly screen structure, these uh, long landscapes. Uh, I thought I wasn't ready to add this element of real-time simulation or a multiplayer. Because I guess uh, it would be interesting to build on that and add in this idea that uh, production, like artistic creation, which is based on an algorithm, on the one hand, uh, it's targeting something indefinite, you can indefinitely generate these environments and uh, objects. Uh, and in Tabor's works that he just showed us, uh, we saw some examples of, uh, well, to me, somebody who is a lover to walk around woods, it's like a horror story. You're going into the woods and you know that you're never going to meet uh, a spot that you've seen before. It's frightening in a way. And on the other hand, you're targeting, well, there's something infinite. And then there's this idea of uh, creating a catalog uh, that uh, you can always like uh, create a catalog of the various out outputs, uh, like in the butterfly uh, room uh, work where all of these organisms uh, are becoming like a set of characters. And it reminded me, me by the way, this um, in Game of Life, intensified, amplified, uh, like uh, like the cellular automaton in a new emanation, if you will. And uh, it would be interesting to get some feedback from Mikhail on this, because um, in your work, the tool, you are talking about uh, this indefinite generation on the one hand and uh, it creates the catalog on the other, and this um, accumulation of language and images. This opportunity to systematize and multiply indefinitely with a lot of randomness as well. Mikhail, well, I don't know. I can't agree with you. I'm not going to say that I see a correlation uh,
between what Tabor does and my work, the tool. Uh, there are some parallels, but I wouldn't say it's as intense as it might seem uh, on the surface. So I guess I can give you a bit more detail about the work and then you can decide for yourselves. Let me first start by showing an intro video and then I'll launch the program itself. Um, and as I launch the program, I will try to keep my mic open. That's the video, it's a very short one. Uh, can you hear me now? So, despite this seeming chaos of movement, I tried to simulate the possibility of translating a sign into a text. An artist, I think, is always worried about the extent to which we, they can work with a text rather than an image. And I try to resolve this uh, for myself with this work. Uh, now we can consider all of the items uh, that are on one of the hor horizon. Uh, and I mentally split the space of the game into four different objects uh, that include all of the objects of the world, four groups, uh, plants, animals, man-made objects, uh, and non-living objects. Um, the non-living objects would include uh, planets, uh, viruses, uh, the man-made objects include uh, planes, uh, plants include mushrooms, um, When we get a set of these objects uh, on one horizontal line, they are they become equal in the right. Um, and by creating named assets from these objects, we start to complicate. Uh, we set on a journey to give them names. And by perhaps unconsciously creating various combinations uh, and encapsulating them, 
the game then asks you to save it in three different states uh, the content uh, and the fetus and these are the, the, the three different states that lead to birth uh, of, a, of a concept and this leads us to create a meta tool a meta asset and when this uh, my additive epistemology the way i called it so uh, we can then name this asset any name like whatever having been created and encapsulated in a text in a word uh, it's being packaged and we have this uh, seeming naming that occurs uh, and by naming these random objects combined with the word tool we cannot it's like we're not explaining the meaning of the word uh, but um, essentially the word itself uh, does not always signify or practically never signifies uh, what it means and then only a chain of words uh, can create some kind of conscious textual message uh, in this game uh, you have the opportunity to send uh, these assets are uh, made of one word or multiple words uh, and you can receive uh, assets that were created by someone else by other users of the game uh, this is the pc version uh, there's also a mobile version you can always create a, a new chain Nikita, you said it resembles a tribal lifestyle well, I'm not sure uh, you said it's similar to what Tabor was doing. <laughs> These are geometric, primitive units. Um, it, this is very interesting and it's very close to media art. Yeah, I'm going to stop at this. I definitely buy your argument that there's a distinction between your practices in this area. I mean, um, it's so interesting to see the kind of, I mean, the focus on them. There's sort of like a monstrosity, a monstrousness about um, combining all these categorically incompatible objects together. And in a way, it's interesting because it's sort of like you could think of it outside of the computer as just an experiment in combining epistemological concepts that don't belong together and see what gets produced. But on some level, I would suggest that it's the computer that allows that kind of combination to happen. Like this, there is some sort of fundamental computational logic about being able to synthesize elements that don't belong together into some sort of unit and, and to apply language to that. Um, it sort of reminds me of experiments that artists are doing with um, machine learning where they create a description of a picture and allow um, GPT, uh, what, are, what GPT are we on? GPT-3, two or four, I've forgotten, um, to generate an image based on the description um, and you know, using its kind of statistical understanding of how images um, are understood by humans. Um, so I think that like that kind of, suggests a line of inquiry that I think is sort of relevant, which is, um, well, maybe um, I have a, a question that might take us in a new direction. I wonder, Tabor, if you have any, um, any res response to jump in or if I should continue on there. Uh, no. Michael, well, that, that was all for me. I agree with what you're saying. 
Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I think one of my interests with World on a Wire um, has been in th sort of thinking about um, how the, like the use of quote unquote nature as topic in many cases for artists working digitally, I almost feel that it's a kind of a stand-in or a way of taking like the default thing that gets simulated in order to think about simulation. So with the game of life, um, John Conway developed the cellular automata, uh, automata that you know, followed a simple set of rules and seems to appear living. Um, and many of the kind of famous algorithms that we know, um, like Boyd's uh, bird, the, the, the flocking algorithms and so forth, these things are, um, are kind of so fundamental to computation itself that it's very, it becomes difficult to understand what computation would be without the effort to model nature. So modeling nature, I feel on some level is so central to what computation even is that when you take on the project of modeling nature, you are in some way thinking philosophically about or asking philosophical questions about computation. And um, you know, I think that's where I would draw a point of connection and departure between you know, the work that you showed. And I think um, yeah, where, where Tabor has kind of brought us up to in you know the kind of very brief survey of, of his practice. Um, I wonder if there's a work that suggests itself to you, Tabor, that we should look at in, res in response to, to some of those ideas. I was thinking a little bit about, um, um, about your rocks project that you did <laughs> when I was looking at the, uh, uh, you know, thinking about these kind of strange tool sets that are appearing in Michael's piece. Um, yeah, for sure. I I did uh, I did a project where I modeled a um, hundred and twenty or something rocks, uh, just like little pebbles. Um, it's not not too unlike this um, butterfly room in a way. Um, but yeah, it was another another piece where it was fun to try to kind of like invent something, you know, and try to uh, use certain limitations so that the rocks aren't completely like based in fantasy, um, yet also are not, you know, just duplicates of rocks that exist. Um, you know, I mean, it's just a very, a very, it's a very small um, um, it's a very small pursuit, what I was going for. You know what I mean? It's kind yeah. of a, a, a fruitless procedure in a way. Yeah, it's an, and, but it, it's such a good subject matter because the rock is like this kind of very fundamental tool. And, um, but I think that the work that you ended up with is quite aesthetically appealing. It's like a little bit unsettling, but more on the side of a kind of harmonious representation of this idea of a synthetic rock. And I guess I wanted to put, kind of put that on the table as a point of discussion, like, Mikhail, is it, in some way, is it your intention to bring out a disharmony in computational systems? And Tabor, conversely, are you particularly interested in like, um, in like a, creating a harmonious experience of synthesis and to, to what end? Um, to, to what extent are you interested in like that, you know, the kind of synthetic harmony that can result from these unusual forms that you create and systems that you create? Or, or is your emphasis a little bit more on trying to create a more subtle, unsettling sort of feeling? Not that you can predict exactly how people will encounter the work. Yeah, so, um, you know, this the simulation of nature is one of the main threads. When I first uh, got to see the first computer in my childhood, and then I got to know 3D graphics. And later on, um, an opinion got crystallized for me that most probably this is the most um, close, so to speak, to in the world. It could be uh, similar to the uh, cubes that uh, nuclear physicists work in, you know, the uh, cubes uh, which are leak proof, air proofed, air proof, in where uh, one can conduct experiments. And I thought that the same was true for computers. It was a kind of a sealed cube where I could conduct experiments. And 
this thought really inspired me for quite a long time. As for now, I can't really formulate what is happening in my practice, but I think that this idea of fully sealed space or fully hermetic space is less true for me. And I think that now everything is a bit different for me. You mean less true than there is digital sorry you mean less true than it used to be less true for you than what um, maybe it's yeah, like... yeah uh, less true for me than it used to be for me in my practice i think that there is no such thing as a pure experiment in the computer i don't think it's possible anymore but anyway I think that uh, computing experiments are very important also for humanity as they allow for more understanding of the world around us. Yeah, I think um, trying to create experiences of harmony or disharmony or, or unsettling or uncanny could have you know, quite profound implications on a political mm. review of what's happening with technology and society as a whole. Yeah, I mean, um, I'd be, I'd, I, guess, I guess I'd welcome comment on that, or we could also talk about your role. Oh. Yeah, yeah I, th I like what uh, Mikhail said, that there's no pure experiment on the computer. Um, and I find that this is true all the time, you know, the simulation of nature is one of the main kind of threads in my work. Um, and lots of times I am just kind of pursuing it for the sake of it, the visual pleasure of it, but also in order to create this sort of soothing effect that's relaxing and peaceful and sort of an antidote to, you know, the pressures of capitalism, basically, which is the second thread in my work. You know, my work is either peaceful about nature or it's more about, you know, the oppressive lens of capitalism. Um, but so regarding what you said that there's no pure experiment, I think that's true. Even in my peaceful nature-based work, there is this, uh, you know, the statement that the, that the material itself makes, you know what I mean? Whether it's a huge LED wall, you know, burning with all that heat, um, or it's like the pixelated picture of the beach, you can't help but feel the tension between the natural world, which is, you know, in conflict with, uh, you know, technology and industry and so on. I've, I've always found it fascinating, Faber, how you've worked sort of in that really central vein of image making. Um, I, I know like the, yeah, that the incredible um, amount of energy you put into computational energy and artistic energy you put into making these works, which I think I always see it as kind of a reflection of um, the energy gets that gets poured into you know, video game experiences. And um, in, in some way, like I'm certainly, you know, really interested in what's happening in video game culture. Um, but I always, I, I guess I always am like unsettled by how extreme the production of video games has become. The AAA titles today are just taking up so much time they're like the great pyramids of our ages you know in terms of the amount of human labor that's going into them and also probably the labor politics involved in that <laughs> and um yeah like how does it feel to put yourself in the position of doing that kind of labor also and how does that relate to your you know practice as a person that's worked contiguously to kind of that kind of commercial world in, in the past well you know, for me, I find that, you know, I think that, I think that humans generate a certain amount of pleasure and purpose through a type of labor, whatever it may be. Um, and we're naturally drawn to, you know, doing things, taking on little projects, whether it's, you know, sharpening a stick or, you know, making a video game, whatever it is. Um, but what I've found that's interesting for me is, you know, as invested as I am in the computer, and, uh, you know, and all my, you know, ability is located within digital tools. I find that sitting in front of the computer is, for me, one of the least natural things possible. Like the, the, the achievement and the creation is really fun, 
But the physical act of being in the chair and sitting in front of the computer and looking at the bright screen is something that I've recently found to be extremely un unpleasant. And this is something I'm kind of negotiating within myself. I think we all are. Um, yeah. Maybe that's a good moment actually to speak about. We talk, You touched on several times in your intro, Mikhail, the question of trying to evoke a psychotic quality in your work, I think was the word, or um, yeah, trying to get at like an incoherence or irrationality or maybe I'm, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm using these terms precisely, but um, yeah, can you talk about how you approach evoking that? Is it, you know, how do you, how do you try and capture that particular mental state through these works? Да, я, дело в том, что э, я довольно как, некоторое время... Sure. The thing is that for quite some time I um, was invested in the cinematic industry. I was working on short films and film production is very closely re related to the emotional life of people and working with affect is one of the biggest components of film industry, I believe. But in most cases, the affect work is very structured there, and it is easily ac accessible. I mean, there are a lot of trainings on how to write scripts uh, for them to affect people emotionally. So when I work with psychotic states, it is interesting for me as it is also about like presenting one's opinion to the audience. And it's a lot about constructing. It's uh, a lot about immersion. I immerse the audience into my work. When I say audience, I don't divide others from myself. I mean, it's not about some rigid uh, rules. I don't want to act like an exploiter. So it's also about my take on myself. Some I alternate between sharper edges and softer edges. And as for the terms I use now, they are theatrical in the nature, but the senses or well, the point is that it's all about communicating your point of view to the other, uh, your point of view or your perspective. And as for what this point of view is, it's a different question and it is more serious one. I'm not sure if uh, it suits our discussion now and whether I'm ready for that question myself now. And since uh, we started speaking about the systems you use that are not fully hermetic or they're not closed in themselves, I remember now Tabor's piece, um, which is about weaponizing the space, which is about using the effective space. I mean, when we encounter interfaces, when we encounter a video game, which and here, this is my guess, that the history of computing is also, also in its origins goes back uh, to military research and the display um, is a kind of a is a kind of a device which was made possible because of radars used again in the army. And I was wondering whether you work with these references to the military technologies, to um, um, how these technologies can be weaponized. Is, an, is it an important reference for you at all? It's a question to you both, whoever wants to answer. I 
смысл своего вопроса, несмотря на то, я, я понимаю так, как... As for, um, this is how I understand your question. So, the only thing we can do is trying to see this difference between our practices and other ways of using the same technologies. In Michael's questions and in your questions, I can see how this blurring of the lines can happen. And as for me personally, I'm not sure where we are heading. I think I can just add the fear of death into our discussion, which is very human, because before that, we've been talking about these questions as something abstract. We uh, were looking at the world like, you know, mathematicians look at their formulas or models. And to show the gap between our practices, I would like to show a short piece with landscape genera generation. And it will be similar um, in the technologies to North Star play table, which we saw at the beginning of our discussion. But it is turned to, I would say, to the more psychotic direction because it's all about a human being, a human being that exists in the bodiless state. Infinite graveyard is the piece that I want to show now. I recorded 666 minutes of this uh, generated content. I posted on YouTube. This is... Um, the longest video one can post on YouTube, possibly. I will show you just a short excerpt from it. No. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Мне очень, конечно, понравилась идея с введением как, э, координат. I really love the idea of introducing coordinates, which, um, which Tabor uses when uh, you can, for example, type uh, the uh, longitude or the particular coordinates of the place uh, and for it to influence the simulation. This is again a very simple game agent engine. And what is growing here is not trees, but some graves graves so we can see an endless graveyard and seasons are changing here the time of the day is changing but the graves are always here So maybe it could lead our discussion somewhere now. Okay. Of course, it is presented as a game, not as a video, which anyone is welcome to launch on their computer. And again, it's about connecting a human being and nature. Although, of course, there is a lot of speculation here in this game, and it's also very human in its nature.
Shakti, but would you like to comment on this topic? Yeah, I think it the the military history behind technology is you know inextricable from any future potentialities of technology. Um, and I think there's a lot of, you know, conflict between the idea that it's very easy as the end of the line user to perceive all this utopian potential in, you know, technology, and the internet and stuff like this. Um, but, you know, the, the reach to which, you know, and my, from my perception, the reach to which good things can happen from this will always be outpaced by, uh, you know, greater human forces of, you know, the, the desire to control and desire to, you know, have power over another person. And so, you know, unfortunately, I think that this is uh, simply, that's simply the case. Um, and if I've, uh, I've tried to address this in the past with, uh, you know, works like Xenix here, um, which reproduces various scenes of high technology across seven screens. Um, and it kind of goes through a journey of modeling, modeling um, these digital weapons, like what you would find in popular video games. And it juxtaposes that with, you know, slice of life imagery, like a, uh, you know, an intelligent smart fridge or online shopping. Um, and, you know, it, and here I'm also, you know, interfacing with sort of the, you know, the, the mythology or, you know, the, the infamy of the phenomenon of, you know, white men in America who do, you know, who go on shooting sprees and the, the uh, you know, the correlation between these games and the people that commit these acts of violence as well as the, you know, the media's, uh, you know, insistence that there, there's actually a causation effect between, you know, the, the entertainment and the things that, you know, the crimes people commit, um, you know, and I present it all here as sort of just a, uh, you know, a salad of ideas, a mixture of ideas um, without sort of pointing at, a, at any sort of conclusion I just kind of draw the visual thread between all these mediums. I think it's definitely the case that online shopping is closely linked to the fear of death, for sure. Mm -hmm. But there's also, you know, an, an interesting aspect of it is, um, I think a big role of technology in the military is, you know, not only to assert dominance, but also to distance the operator from the act of violence mm. um, and um, and I think that I think often of the story of um, John and James Whitney the early computer animators um, the way they began working with computer animation was that they were exploring a California junkyard and they came across um, a, an analog computer that was used to aim anti-aircraft anti guns uh, during World War II um, oh, I'm, yeah, during World War II. And this was a highly unsuccessful attempt to, um, to use an analog computer to kind of graph, to plot the trajectory of an airplane. But the way that it worked was that each, each operator would be responsible for a single variable. So one person would input the height of the airplane. They would make an estimation of the height and put it in. Another would estimate the speed. And then this kind of complicated sequence of gears would move the battery of guns in a certain way, um, which has a really interesting effect of like distributing the agency of this act of violence or bringing down the airplane. But it was important, you know, it was, the technology was not there, but it was interesting that like, you know, this really founding moment of computer animation happened because specifically of the reuse of the military technology for a different purpose. And I think, um, yeah, I think distancing us from that moment of death either as perpetrator or victim um, does seem like a really central role of all of these technologies that um, 
yeah, I can, I somehow see it as much in an image of a fridge as I do of an image of a graveyard in a strange way. I'm not sure exactly, um, exactly why, <laughs> but the, the link feels very compelling to me. And I think also like it is, you know, the question of death is very present in video, video game aesthetics, which, um, uh, you know, I think people use the video game to kind of dissociate from their surroundings and to dissociate from the body even to just dissociate, you know, you want to kind of leave your body behind in, in a certain way with, even though you're, you're using different parts of the body, but there is this, you know, you want to kind of merge with, with that environment in a certain way. But also when you die, you get to come back. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's like a central promise of the video game. И не знаю, хотим ли мы, uh, есть ли у нас, может быть, какие-то... Микита, uh, maybe there are some uh, final remarks um, that we can make. Uh, I don't think we don't have any questions uh, from this stream. Uh, if we do get them, we'll have time to answer them. Talking about death, it's uh, a bit of a dramatic notes to end up on, but uh, somehow I went back to the beginning of our discussion when you showed your work, so I really liked the fact that they were arranged in a similar fashion. You had this uh, photo of the exposition uh, where you had this uh, simulation uh, a bit of, offered uh, by the artist. Uh, it was an interesting parallel that I noticed. Uh, but so uh, this uh, reality that uh, was uh, more dead than the simulation or the render or the work that was uh, generated in advance. Mikhail, I'm also thinking about um, This information going back to this computer that was found, the story. Now to control military drones, the, the experiments being carried out in controlling military drones so with uh, a mental effort. And at this point, uh, technologies are at a stage uh, where controlling the drone requires about uh, five, six uh, soldiers. Uh, each one needs to mentally think one would be responsible for moving the drone up, the other one would be responsible for moving it left, the other one right, and the another one for shooting. And together, they are able to control the drone. So it, it's like a dream at this point, a military dream, dream of the army, where you can work as a single whole. But again, it's a multiplayer simulation in a Call of Duty. In the future, these neuro interfaces are not available yet, but they will be, of course. I think that's an excellent note to end on, to look towards the future, not just about that, which is happening in the future for most of us. Um, but this was a really interesting conversation and I feel like um, I feel like, you know, there are so many threads that got opened up that I hope you know, to kind of carry with me um, as we go into our final our online conversation in this series uh, next week. Um, I, are we meeting on Wednesday next week? Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, I, I should also cite before we go, oh yeah, August 4th, that's Wednesday, right? Yeah. Um, I, I should cite before I go that the, uh, the story I told about the Whitney Brothers is uh, found in the writing of Zabbat Patterson, which is quite interesting um, for those that are interested. And um, yeah, this recording will be on YouTube, right, Nikita, for those that want to follow up? So the uh, recording will be available in both languages.
Um, great. And then so for the rest of us, please join us Wednesday, August 4th, noon Eastern time and 7 p.m. Moscow time for Timur Sichin and um, in conversation with Elena Shapovalova and Alisa Smorgina. Um, and uh, make sure to see Assuming Distance before it closes Sunday. Да, и, и, и также будем uh, ждать uh, выставку Мир на проводе, которая... The World on the Wire exhibition uh, is coming to Moscow in autumn. Don't miss that. Thank you so much uh, to everyone. I uh, was very happy to see you all today. Thank you, Tabor. Thank you, Michael, for an interesting conversation. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Спасибо, да. Пока всем.